and welcome to Enquire to Choir. My name is Eva and I'm here to help you, fellow choir people. I present you with a new video series here on the channel on a long-awaited topic, choir vocal technique. During the next five weeks, I will do my best to thoroughly explain, demonstrate and show everything about the vocal technique your choir needs to start and or to prosper. Since vocal technique in general is a thing you need to be doing in person, I have thought a lot about the way I'm going to present this to you in a way which makes everything concise and clear while being utterly useful and applicable. Bear in mind, I don't know you and I don't know your choir. I don't know your backgrounds or your past experience. Therefore, I tried to make this accessible to everyone. I believe there is a certain logic when it comes to choir vocal technique, which is relatively simple once you understand it. So it becomes much easier to teach your choir vocal technique. That said, this is the first video in which I talk about the basics which I think are important to go through before we tackle on more specific topics in the next videos and in the next weeks. This video has three parts, theory, practice, and how to teach your choir vocal technique. What is vocal technique and why is it important? The most often definition of vocal technique I hear is, it's a technique that makes you sing better and or correctly. For me, the aim of working on vocal technique is getting the best sound possible with a person's current vocal apparatus in the healthiest way possible, without doing any damage to your body, short term or long term. For choirs, dedicating time for doing vocal technique will certainly benefit the sound. However, it's not just about the sound. It's about the stamina and the longevity of your choir singer's singing. You want to do this for your choir. The choir's sound will become better and richer, and by continually working on it, your choir singers will become more and more capable of singing more difficult pieces more easily. And it's not just about the vocal range or singing the high notes, which I get often asked. It's about getting your choir to do everything better, from controlling the breath to singing challenging rhythmical figures. Singing is breathing. Same way hiking is essentially walking. Think of singing as breathing with a twist. Singing should actually feel like breathing, but this kind of breathing uh, requires special management. People always think the voice being like an instrument. Technically, our body is an instrument. Think of a guitar, for example. There are strings you play and you make the sound. The reason the sound happens in a way we hear it in a guitar is because a guitar has a body. In that body, which is hollow, resonance happens. Or, an important analogy for the video, think of a clarinet. You push the air into the tube. You blow into it to get the sound. But actually what happens is you manage the amount of air in a special way. You get it in the instrument very precisely with your mouth in a specific way it requires for it to be able to get into the tube. When it's in the tube, you manipulate it by pressing the buttons and covering the holes of the tube and then the air goes out of the tube freely. The air you push into the tube is actually free to go out of it once you manipulate it. It passes through the clarinet as free as a bird, but it has been taken care of in a special way while in the tube. When you think about tension in all of this, and tension is a word I'm going to talk about in this video, only the beginning part of making that sound is actually tense. The way you push the air into the tube, the way you blow into the tube is tense. Your mouth is tight, 
the moment is quick. But once in the tube, the air is free of tension and free to resonate as much as it can. However, while the air is free to go through the tube, it exists only during you supporting it by blowing into the tube. So it's not a miraculous thing that happens. It has to be constantly worked on. It's like a bicycle. When it moves, it goes. Once it stops, it falls down. Something along this happens in our bodies while we do air management or during singing. It's just upside down. Our air or our sound comes out of our mouths after traveling through our air tubes, but it began at the most famous place in singing, the diaphragm. Question time. How many times have you heard the sentence use your belly or use your diaphragm as an instruction in singing without actually knowing what that means? Maybe you did know what a diaphragm is in theory, but you probably don't actually understand what it means. Use your belly. Sing on your diaphragm. Same here. It took me 12 years to figure that out. A diaphragm is a muscle. It's shaped like a dome and it works as a membrane between the chest and the abdominal cavities. It separates the chest from the abdomen and it sits in the base of the chest. If you look at my Snoopy, there is a reason why I wore a Snoopy t-shirt in this video. This is the chest cavity and at the end of the Snoopy is a diaphragm. I want you to have this point of reference, okay? So look at the Snoopy. Remember the guitar? It has a hollow body. So do we. We are full of cavities, the good ones. We are hollow in the abdomen, which is called the abdominal cavity. We are hollow in the chest, which is called the chest cavity. And you know who loves hollow places? Resonance. By definition, resonance in physics is the reinforcement or prolongation of sound by reflection from a surface or by the synchronous vibration of a neighboring object. In music, resonance, the quality of a sound of being deep, full and reverberating. So you make the sound, it happens, but the sound becomes stronger when it reflects from something and when it has the space to vibrate in, which leads us to the conclusion with our bodies, we are perfectly equipped for singing. We want as much resonance as we possibly can get. We can get that by getting as much as free space we possibly can. And this is where the diaphragm thing comes into play. The diaphragm is a muscle. It's thin and it's a membrane. Because it's a muscle, it works automatically and it has two states, contraction and relaxation. When it's relaxed, it's shaped like a dome, like this. But when it's contracting, it expands and it looks like this. So this is relaxed and this is contracted, which is a bit counterintuitive. And this is where I see the biggest problem when it comes to understanding how a diaphragm works. It works automatically, so it constantly goes from being shaped like a dome when it's in relaxation to a contraction, which makes her look like this. When the diaphragm is contracted or when it's going into a contraction, it pushes the abdominal organs and everything that's down there down and out in the outer space. You see that by the belly expanding. Okay, so this is the diaphragm and it goes to a contraction and everything that's below the diaphragm when it's relaxed goes even further down below or out. Alongside that, the chest cavity becomes bigger. It gets a bit more space because the chest cavity is above the diaphragm. So this, 
the space becomes available to the chest cavity. This is a process that happens automatically. Remember, it's a muscle. The best part about this is that the contraction happens during inhalation and the relaxation of the diaphragm happens during exhalation. This in life we call breathing with our belly or deep breathing. It is not something we as grown-ups tend to do. Somebody has to teach us that again. They say we breathe like this when we are kids, but then we see how grown-ups breathe and we tend to imitate them. So we forget about our bellies. The reason this kind of breathing is so deep is because it works with the biggest amount of air you can possibly take every time. Unlike the chest breathing, which is very shallow. In all TV shows, when somebody is having a panic attack, they give them a bag to breathe into. This is because breathing into something tends to activate the diaphragm. Which brings me to something I will greatly expand in the next video, which is you can't intentionally move your diaphragm the way you want to. It's a muscle. The same way you can't move your bicep. I will now move my bicep. You can't actually do that, but you can do a motion that activates and moves your bicep. So you can't just decide, I'm now going to sing with my diaphragm, but you can do a certain kind of motions or vocal exercises to activate your diaphragm. This you can learn by dedicated work and every singer has to do that for him or herself with the guidance from a vocal teacher. And that's where this whole deep breathing problem shows. Remember, singing is breathing. We can sing in many possible ways, but diaphragmatic breathing is best for singing. When we inhale, we inhale. When we exhale, we sing. Singing is exhalation charged with music. So now let's connect everything. We inhale to take the biggest possible breath we can. During inhalation, our diaphragm contracts and goes into the opposite position. That makes the chest cavity larger and we see the belly is expanding to outer space. It becomes bigger. At that very moment, our diaphragm is tight. This makes it the perfect spot to start our sound. Remember the clarinet. That's the beginning of the clarinet. When you have to blow into the tube, you are tense. The beginning of your tube is on your diaphragm. Because when we start to sing, we start to exhalate. During exhalation, the diaphragm goes back into its relaxed state, which automatically pushes the air into the chest cavity and gives this air more support to freely go into your air tubes. Can you see? This kind of breathing gives you the biggest amount of air it gives you the push you need to make your air become the most powerful sound and it does so automatically. Let's give a round of applause to our best friend, the diaphragm. This air you have created is the start of the sound because this air goes to the vocal cords. Vocal cords are composed of thin enfoldings of membrane stretched horizontally across the larynx. The vocal cords start to do their thing when they receive air. They vibrate, modulating the airflow that is being expelled from the lungs during phonation. Phonation is a technical term for giving music to the breath. Belly breathing is also extremely beneficial for your vocal cords because when you're using your diaphragm, your vocal cords tend to get a really thought out, controlled breath and they do not get brisk and sharp attacks of air. This makes the vibration of vocal cords much more natural. Their function is to vibrate when they are being fueled with air. The point I'm getting to now is what I always tell my choirs. Once you make the breath, it has to be free to go outside of your body. 
Don't push against it. Don't make it harder for the air to come out. It needs to be free to go outside. What's the point of making and taking the biggest breath you possibly could if you then stop it or make it really hard for it to come outside? You have to manage the breath while it's in your air tubes. But you manage it by pushing the buttons or covering the holes. Not by tensing everything up and stopping it from coming outside. When you combine this intention with the fact that we want as much air as we can possibly get and we want as much space as we can possibly get because that works well for the resonance to happen, this leads me to conclude when the air has left the diaphragm, we just need to make everything as relaxed as possible and give it the biggest amount of space it can possibly get while still supporting it. That means our diaphragm is working all the time. It's the base of your air tube, just like the sound you get from a clarinet. The air has to be supported and it's been supported by a contracted diaphragm that is going into a relaxed state. Now, what that means in practice. To make everything clean and simple, there are three rules we can conclude from the previous talk. Rule number one, no tension other than in the belly during exhalation or during singing. Rule number two, this must be comfortable for the body because, hello, any stress on the body will create tension and we don't want it. And rule number three, this should be easy. Why easy? Because we are going to do this all the time. So it has to become a natural thing for the body. This is what I mean by saying it should be easy. So what does the body look like while it's singing? Using the correct vocal technique, we'll go through all the body parts that we have to. Let's start with the legs. Both feet are on the ground. Legs are slightly apart because that supports the upper body. The knees are not locked. The legs are not tight. They're a stable foundation for everything that is happening above them. Pelvic floor should be straight, but it has to be flexible. That means it should not be tilted to either side, left, right, front, back, but it should be flexible in order to support everything the diaphragm and the belly is doing. When it comes to our backs, straight, but not tight, and especially not tilted, definitely not hunched over. Our bellies expand to the outer space while we take a breath. It tenses up gradually during exhalation. Our arms, well, they're free to do anything. And actually, I will show in the next video how using your arms can really support you taking the correct breath. What I don't recommend is them sitting tightly on the belly, which restricts everything. When it comes to your chest, the chest is lifted straight, but it's not moving intentionally while breathing. What I mean by that, you should not be pulling it up intentionally. They move, but the reason they move is because it's an automatic process because of the belly breathing, but you should not be pulling it up in order to do it better. It only makes it worse. So it should be peaceful, but working accordingly to your belly. Shoulders. Ah, yes, the biggest tell-all sign. While breathing, do not pull up your shoulders. Don't do anything with them. They should be level and there should be no tension in them. Why? When you tense them, you block the air. When you pull them up, you block everything here. They should be relaxed but alert and supportive of everything your body is doing. And now to the best part, our head. There is so much space you can give your breath when it comes to the head space. We have a thing called the oral cavity. We have more cavities like 
the nose cavity, etc. But now I'm talking about the oral cavity. Obviously, you want to make as much resonance as you possibly can without restricting the air. That means we want more space. The most obvious one to give the air the space that it wants and needs is to open your mouth. But how do you open it? While they're singing, when I tell my choir members to open their mouth, they go from this to this. And they think they have opened their mouth. And while technically that may be true, that's not a very big movement. The right way to open your mouth is to pull your chin down. This is the chin and it goes down. Uh, you can thank me in the comments for doing this on YouTube. Okay, so you go like this and you literally pull it down. Okay, so it goes down vertically. The problem with this is most people pull down their heads and not just their chin. They do this. This is completely wrong because when you do this, you obviously restrict everything here. But this is something we do without realizing we do it. So the biggest vocal problem I see, and I'm again making a video about it in the following weeks, is pulling your chin down. Another way you can open your oral cavity a bit more is to open your eyes. It is not a coincidence that every opera singer during singing looks very surprised. Opening your eyes moves a nerve called nervus facialis. Activating that nerve tends to bring the soft palate a bit up. This makes the oral cavity a bit bigger and we like every bit of space we can possibly get. When you connect all of this, your singing actually looks like this. First, just the breathing. Can you see anything? Probably not. Maybe you saw my Snoopy moving, but it's not that big of a deal. The point where there is the biggest movement is my belly. And I will now show you my belly without showing my belly. Okay, so this is my belly. Inhale. Okay, so this is not moving. This is moving to the outer space. You're welcome. Okay, so the moment we start to sing, the moment be just before we start to sing, you took the breath and your body is all prepared. What does that look like? It looks like this. The mouth are open, eyes are open, chin is level, shoulders, this is all relaxed, but our bellies are tense. What does this look like? Like I'm very surprised, right? When you think about this, at that very moment, you are best equipped for making the biggest, the most potent sound you can possibly make. While being completely alert, your senses are completely aware, your eyes are open, your adrenaline goes a bit up. That is our body being able to make the best possible reaction while in danger. When you see a lion, you go like this. <gasps> You're ready to sing. There is an evolutionary reason why our bodies are equipped this way and why our diaphragm is so cool. And the thing about resonance, your sound doesn't have to be loud, but if it's enriched by a good amount of resonance, it will travel well and further than a sound without it. And that is very important for me to mention. All of this vocal technique works for every possible state of singing. It does not change when you sing softly. This is the same when you want to sing forte and when you want to sing piano. Some other things are different, which we're going to talk about. But please remember that this vocal technique, this theory, 
this basic theory of it works and should work all the time. Now, how to teach your choir vocal technique. This may come as a shock to you, but I do not know how to whistle. Stick with me, I have a point. And every time I tell someone I do not know how to whistle, they go, how can you not know how to whistle? You just do this. And then they whistle. And I'm always perplexed by this phenomenon because you whistling doesn't actually make me learn how to whistle. I don't know what I have to do. If I want to learn how to whistle, you need to explain to me what I have to do with every part of my mouth. I feel pretty much the same when it comes to showing someone the right vocal technique. It's not so useful just to sing and for them to repeat it. This works only to a small extent. It's about getting your choir members to understand where and how to feel certain parts of their bodies and their vocal apparatus to make them constantly aware of what correct singing feels like. Because listening to a sound is not that telling. When you work as a vocal teacher, you probably have one student at a time and you work with him or her. Obviously in choirs, that's not the case. You have a group of people and you can't possibly correct them individually every time, all the time. You can't possibly know and have the attention all the time for everyone. But there is a combination of ways you can actually teach them vocal technique. Firstly, do a theory lesson. Make the time. Take one rehearsal to teach them all the basics. Everything I said in this video is all they need to know for starting. But take the time to explain to them what everything means. So they understand you every time you mention something about this using the language you are explaining them in the vocal lesson. Every further rehearsal. Take the time. It saves you time in the future. When you have new singers, when you accept new singers in an audition, make the first rehearsal they have a vocal lesson. I do that every time. I tell them for the first rehearsal, come an hour early. Once you do this, once your choir learns this new language you are speaking, give them instruction all the time. Every possible time you can say something about the correct vocal technique, which is useful at that very moment, without being excessive, right? Give the instruction. For example, they have to sing a really long note. Tell them, use your bellies. Simple and short instructions all the time, while still being reasonable, right? Is a very efficient method for implementing this way of thinking in their minds. So your singers start thinking this way by themselves automatically, like a reflex. I believe this is very useful when you are reading a new music score, especially. If you give them an instruction immediately, they will start connecting the vocal technique with particular parts in the score much more efficiently. They become more and more aware, and while doing that in a longer period of time, it becomes more natural. Plus, remember, our famous diaphragm is a muscle. The more you practice it, the better it works. This is a strong one. Recognize visual cues. You can't possibly know all the time who sings without the correct vocal technique. But when you look at all of the things I talked about in the previous chapters, it becomes really obvious that you can tell by the way your singers look if they're singing okay. It's not a complete correlation, but there is a certain amount of reliable correlation. If you see them pulling their shoulders up while they're breathing, that's a bad sign. If their mouths are not open by pulling their chin down, that tells you something. You can actually see when they're doing something wrong. And if you can't see it during the rehearsal or during the performance, watch the video of the performance later. I heard one 
professor of mine saying, when you take a picture of a choir during the performance, they should all look the same and you should be able to tell what vowel they were singing at that time. There will be a video about pronunciation in singing, so stick around or subscribe. <laughs> This one is obvious, but recognize the audio cues as well. And of course, if the vocal technique is not the best, you can hear it. But what I'm talking about here is take notice of the amount of sound it's actually coming out of their mouths. And if there is a murmur, when the vocal technique is not really good, you tend to hear less of a sound and more of a murmur like this. Ah, this is like really bad, but this as well. Ah, you, you hear a murmur. That's a sign that not everything is working the way it's supposed to, especially when you connect all of the singers and that's what a choir does. It adds up, so it's telling. And finally, most of the vocal technique lessons you do for your choir is done indirectly while warming up. I have a secret to tell you. Most of the choir warm-ups are not for warming up. They will warm up your vocal apparatus, but that's not the biggest reason why we insist on it. The warm-ups are mostly for working on your vocal technique. That is the reason why there are lots of different kinds of vocal warm-ups. Will you get some in this series? Yes, you will. Additionally, one of the videos in this series will be about this very topic, how to warm up your choir. So again, stick around. I know there are people out there who think doing vocal technique is just wasting the choir's time because either it already has a good sound and you don't need to fix it or the singers find it boring so the choir director doesn't insist on it or actually the only reason I can understand the choir barely has enough time to work in general and barely has enough time to read the new score, let alone taking the time to do vocal technique. And while I do have sympathy for the last reason, I have to say, I will now pull out my ace and tell you, you as the choir director have the responsibility to take care of your singer's vocal apparatus. You are responsible for their help. You can do permanent damage if you ignore vocal technique. If you're not confident about it or you are not confident enough to teach it to your choir, take a singing lesson on your own. Every trained singer can show you the basics. Just a single hour will make a huge difference. Or you can invite the trained singer to do a lesson to you and your choir. That is extremely beneficial Nobody says you need to do vocal technique all by yourself. You can even have a dedicated person who is not actually working with the choir, but when it comes to the vocal technique, they work with the choir. However, I'm going to repeat this. You are responsible for the health of their vocal apparatus. If you're not working on that, if you don't want to think about that, I'm sorry, but that is very inconvenient that is very bad but if you're still here watching this obviously i am preaching to the choir and that is it that was the first video the basics if you wish to see more from inquiry to choir uh, you can watch all of the other videos here you can subscribe uh, when it comes to the series there will be a new video every week. If you have a question for me, you don't want to comment down below, you can email me and you can find me on Facebook. I hope to see you again very soon. Conduct well, conductors, and I'll see you next time. Bye!